Alright, um, okay, I've never actually like used this camera to record a video before, so I'm trying it out. And I also have a mic, so it's kind of cool. But, um, well, there's some stuff that I want to tell you guys that is kind of going to be my life for the next three, four months. But right now, Eric's picking me up because um, I'm going with him and Taylor to this cafe or a restaurant to study, so. Hi everyone, I'm Kyle's vlog. <laughs> I forgot y'all are like vloggers or whatever. <laughs> Yo, my bad. All right, I really hope this microphone works. I'm currently a junior at Princeton, um, and I'm pre-med, which means that I will be taking the MCAT. Um, and next semester, I will be studying abroad in London at the Royal College of Music. And so I'm going to be trying to start this MCAT study series, kind of. Basically, my, my goal is to get through all the Kaplan books when I'm in London, um, and I'm going to make like a study vlog kind of every week. Basically, be showing you guys what it's like to be a study abroad student, and what it's like to be studying for the MCAT as well. At the end of every video, I'm gonna be giving like a short summary of everything I learned in the unit, partially to keep myself accountable, but also so that anyone who's watching can like, I don't know, study with me if they want. So right now, I'm at Eden Plant & Co. with um, Eric and Taylor studying because they are also taking the MCAT. Yeah, right now I'm studying biochem because I haven't actually taken the course, but I thought it'd be a good place to start since I'll take the course anyway later at Princeton. So might as well get a head start. It's time lapse time. After I recorded the time lapse, I was wildly unproductive. Um, I think I maybe dead ass got through like five more pages after that. It's cool. I finished the first chapter today. Pretty proud of that. Um, and now we're gonna go to Jollibee. I'm in the middle. Okay, um, so this is my first attempt at trying to summarize what I've learned. So, I guess for this video, what I'm going to be going over is chapters 1 and 2 of the Kaplan Biochem book. The way that I approached this like, was kind of learning it for the first time, so uh, I took notes when I read through the chapter, and then when I was deciding how to make this summary, I decided to make kind of like a review document with that was like a summary of the notes that I took, which still ended up being pretty long because this being the first time learning it, I wasn't really sure how to summarize it as well as I'd like. That's why it took me so long to record this part of the video. Um, like I'm currently on a cruise. So now I'm going to explain chapter one, amino acids. So to start off this chapter, 
we have to memorize the 20 amino acids. Um, and we do this by their properties. There's seven amino acids that have non-polar, non-aromatic side chains. The first one is glycine, where the side chain R is just a hydrogen. The next four amino acids all have alkyl side chains. The first one is alanine, which uh, just has one carbon as a side chain. Uh, we have valine, which has three carbons in the shape of a V so for valine. We have leucine, which has four carbons, and we have isoleucine, which also has four carbons, but in a different uh, orientation. Um, and these are easy to remember because it's isoleucine and leucine, so they're related, so they both have four carbons. I also have methionine, which has two carbons, and then a sulfur, and then another carbon. Then we have proline, where the side chain is a five-membered ring um, that includes the nitrogen that's part of the, the base amino acid. So we have three amino acids with aromatic side chains. One is tryptophan, which has the indole group, phenylalanine, which is just alanine with the phenyl group on it. And then we have tyrosine, which is just phenylalanine with an OH um, attached to it, which makes it polar. Um, the next set are five amino acids with a polar side chain. So the first one is uh, serine, which has an OH. There's threonine, which has uh, two C's and an OH, where the side chain is attached to the middle carbon. Cysteine, which um, has an SH, and that's important in making disulfide bonds. Asparagine and glutamine, which are very similar, except glutamine has one extra carbon. There's a carbonyl and then uh, an NH2 uh, at the end of the side chain um, for both of these. Then we have two amino acids with negatively charged side chains. Um, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, which are obviously related to asparagine and glutamine. Um, so we replace the NH2 on those with uh, an OH or an O- depending on which form you want. Um, the last three are amino acids with a positively charged side chains. There's uh, histidine, which has an imidazole group. There's arginine, which has three ends kind of clumped together at the end. And then there's uh, lysine which has just an NH3 group all the way at the end. Okay, so the next big important concept is acid-base chemistry with amino acids. Um, so here, one of the key ideas is that uh, amino acids have two pKa's, one for the COOH group and then one for the NH2 group. At lower pHs, since there's a lot of um, hydrogens floating around, the amino acid will be fully protonated, which means we have the COOH and the NH3+, which gives it a plus one charge. That physiological pH, we're gonna have a neutral amino acid, but it's gonna be a zwitterion. But what that means is that there is one positive and one negative charge. So the negative charge is the COO minus and the positive charge is the NH3 plus. Um, and then as we move up to higher pHs, we have um, more OHs that will deprotonate the um, hydrogens on the amino acid, which means it's fully deprotonated and has a negative one charge. Uh, amino acids have a thing called PI, which is the isoelectric point. And this is the pH where the molecule is neutral. Now for neutral um, amino acids, the PI is just the average of the pKa of the carboxylic acid group and the um, amine group. But if we have an acidic or a basic side chain, then that changes because for an acidic amino acid, we have two carboxylic acid groups, which means that as we go from low to high pH, as we are deprotonating this amino acid, we are first deprotonating um, one COOH and then the second COOH um, instead of deprotonating the NH3 second, which means that the uh, pH at which we uh, get our neutral amino acid is gonna be much lower because we are deprotonating with the two lower pKa's. So um, onto protein structure. So primary structure is just the amino acid chain. So the second secondary structure are gonna be alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. For tertiary structure, this is how the protein kind of looks in 3D. Um, it's how it starts folding. There's two types, there's fibrous and globular. The way that the, the structure forms is basically that hydrophobic groups um, interact with each other, the side chains interact with each other, and the hydrophobic groups uh, have interactions on the inside to stay away from the um, aqueous environment. Uh, then we have quaternary structure, which is basically just multiple um, tertiary structures interacting with each other. And quaternary structure will induce cooperativity or allosteric effects, which is basically if one subunit of the protein is changed, then it affects the activity of the other. And then we have something called conjugated proteins, which is basically proteins where the functions come from attached groups called 
prosthetic groups. So for example, in uh, hemoglobin, the heme is the prosthetic group and that gives the hemoglobin their function of carrying oxygen. Um, so chapter two is enzymes. Okay, there's six categories. Oxidoreductases, um, there's transferases. We have hydrolases, which uh, catalyzes hydrolysis. There's lyases, which also cleave uh, one molecule into two. This can also be the other way around where we have a synthase which basically bring two molecules into one. Um, an isomerase is kind of what it sounds like. It'll catalyze the rearrangement of bonds in a molecule. And then we have ligases which um, basically stick things together. So for enzyme kinetics, um, a major idea here is that uh, as we increase the substrate concentration, the reaction rate will increase but It'll plateau at a certain point, so it kind of looks like a uh, hyperbolic curve. To represent this, we have the Michaelis-Menten equation. Km is going to be the substrate concentration where half of the enzymes are being used or filled. Uh, we also can write that Vmax is going to be uh, Kcat multiplied by the concentration of E. Um, Kcat is basically the reaction rate between the enzyme substrate complex to the enzyme plus the products. Uh, this explains the Vmax equation because basically it's just you have this much enzyme and this is how fast you can turn it into these products. I kind of talked about cooperative enzymes earlier. These have different enzyme kinetics and instead of this kind of like hyperbolic curve, they have this like S-shaped curve. So if we increase the binding of the substrate to the enzyme, it'll change the enzyme from the tense state to the relaxed state. And we have something called the Hill's coefficient to measure how cooperative two enzymes are. Reverse inhibition. So there's four different types. The first one is competitive, which is the most simple one. Basically the inhibitor um, binds to the active site so that the substrate can't bind to it and therefore the reaction doesn't proceed. And this doesn't change Vmax because the reaction rate itself is the same if the substrate gets to bind. The second one we have is non-competitive. The inhibitor will basically bind to an allosteric site, which is a site that isn't the active site that's also on the enzyme. In inhibition, the inhibitor can bind to either the enzyme itself or the enzyme substrate complex. If the inhibitor doesn't have different affinities for binding to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex, then it's called non-competitive. And basically when it binds to either the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex, basically inactivates the enzyme so that the reaction cannot continue. We have uncompetitive inhibition, where basically this only happens when the inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex. So after the substrate binds to the enzyme, sometimes it'll change the shape of the enzyme so that um, there's another uh, site where an inhibitor can bind. Um, and once it binds, it prevents the enzyme from releasing the substrate and the products. And then we have mixed, which is basically where an inhibitor can bind to either the uh, enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex, but they have different affinities. We have some enzymes that are regulated. One of them is allosteric enzymes, which I kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, inhibitor or an activator will bind to a different site. There's um, covalently modified enzymes. These covalently modified enzymes uh, change in activity based on what groups are added or taken away from it. Um, then we have zymogens. So basically some enzymes are really harmful in their active state. And so they are released as zymogens. Uh, they, they have like a regulatory piece to it. So you can either get rid of it or you can like deactivate the regulatory part so that your enzyme is active. Okay, um, that was chapters one and two. So enzymes and amino acids. It was my first time trying to teach this and it was really actually kind of awkward. It also made me realize that it was, it'll take a lot longer for me to actually understand what I'm trying to say. So some sections I understood a lot better than others, but hopefully I guess the notes might help um, because I know my explanations need some work. I also decided that I'm gonna switch to the Gen Chem book because I've actually learned Gen Chem. So I think that would actually be more of a review. And I think for the purposes of starting this like video series, I think that'd be better because I'm gonna be better at creating a summary and explaining it. So that's chapter one and two. Next time is going to be Gen Chem. Once I'm back, on land like in September and I'll have moved in and school's gonna start soon for my uh, study abroad semester so I'm excited to show you guys what it's like but <sighs> thanks for joining me for this first video and um, I'll see you guys next time